Hey guys, Tom here. This is T-Discovery and today I'm going to talk about why your gear doesn't matter. Or does it? So if you're anything like me, some point during your creative journey, you have had a severe case of gas or gear acquisition syndrome. Companies want us to believe all the time that their latest and greatest newest product is the best thing out on the market and it's a new and improved version of the old stuff they had and if you go out and buy it, you're gonna get better results and better videos, better photos, whatever it is. But the truth of the matter is, Gear doesn't automatically make you more creative or more successful in whatever you're doing. So when I started taking photography a little bit more seriously, I went out, my first ever sort of bridge camera was the Fuji, I think it was a Finepix S5600. So this was an all-in-one camera with a digital zoom sort of control and you couldn't change the lenses or anything on it and I went out and I bought it and it had some manual control on it and I started learning all about sort of the exposure triangle. So if you don't know what the exposure triangle is, uh, it's basically the balance between your shutter speed, your aperture and your ISO or ISO and at that time uh, I was still hanging around with a lot of friends who were actually doing BMXing and things like that and so I went out and because you couldn't change the lens you could actually buy little sort of lens things like a, not adapters but like lenses that screw on to the front of the existing lens but I loved using it it gave this like really weird wide angle sort of effect like really distorted uh, and back when I was sort of learning photography and we did shoot a lot of videos on it as well but it gave this sort of crazy like mad vignetted fisheye effect which at the time I really loved and it got me out using that camera as a starting point to learn photography and more about videography. So I think that camera back in the day was probably, I it couldn't have been any more than 200 pounds. I went out, I wanted a digital camera. It was the first one I ever bought for myself. So you've got to remember that every digital camera that I'd used up until that point was, it was somebody else's. I never actually owned my own camera. And I did used to take my these cameras out with me a lot. And I was always filming my friends and taking photographs and everything. Now the cliche thing would be to say that I've been taking photos since I was, however old and I, you know I was destined to be a photographer but that was never the the case with me I, I I never had that camera I never went out and took photos thinking oh this is a career that I want to jump into it never worked like that and the key point for me which is which is what has become a problem uh, for me recently is that back at that time I loved taking photographs and videos and I did it all for myself and I used to make up these stupid little videos using Windows Movie Maker and I used to uh, invite friends around and we'd sit there watching these videos on my computer and we'd, like, we'd just laugh at all the stupid stuff we got up to but it was, a real, it was a real passion there for me to actually go out and do these things back then. My second digital camera was the Canon EOS 400D and I actually bought it along with the 18-55 to kit lens and at the time I wanted something with more reach as well so I actually bought a really cheap, I think like again sub £200, 90-300mm to lens which went from something like f4 to f5.6 as you zoomed and buying a DSLR was was a whole new experience for me. I'd never had anything you could change the lenses on before and I remember, I mean this camera I think is from 2007 and I remember at the time I used to see adverts on the TV for it and I fell for that advert like hook, line and sinker. I remember like dreaming about this camera for so long and I finally went out and I actually bought this camera um, and I think at the time it was probably about 400 pounds and I bought a lens and uh, an old, um, I can't even remember the name of the flash. I'll have to look, oh, Sunpack. It was a Sunpack flash unit, which had no manual control. The only controls it actually had on the back of it were to increase the exposure of the flash. It was all like ETTL controlled, like through the hot shoe on the camera. And the only thing you could change was sort of the exposure compensation on the flash itself. So you could go up by, I think three stops and down by three stops in one stop increments. So it, it, it was just ridiculous. You basically just left it on auto and did what you want with it. So as I 
learned with this equipment. I didn't buy any other stuff for it really at the time. I was more sort of, I've got my camera, got a couple of lenses, let's go out, let's start just doing things with this and see what we can come up with. So I remember me and my friends used to go out quite a lot at night at one point. We actually started uh, doing the whole light painting sort of thing and, and we ended up going down a, a local park and, and doing some sort of crazy light painting things that were like really bad. But I remember we had a real laugh doing it. We were just experimenting with all these different things, you know, a group of us together and we just, we had glow sticks and, and torches and, and all sorts of like random little things that could create any sort of light and we were seeing what we could do with it. I think I had the most fun with that camera than, than any other camera I've ever used. Eventually I decided to try and do some weddings. So my first wedding, it was the worst experience of my entire life. I, I went out just before the wedding, um, probably two weeks before the wedding, and I actually bought a the Nifty 50 for about £100, I think it was, the 50mm Canon f1.8, because I knew the Canon 400D only went up to ISO 1600. Now, if you're shooting a wedding and you're indoors all day, you're either relying on your ISO or a flash. Um, so I knew I wanted to let as much natural light to be able to get into that camera as possible. So I went out, bought a new lens for it, went out and tested it for a while. And, and uh, that was sort of an impulse purchase that that I bought specifically to photograph this wedding. I should mention that I didn't actually get paid for this wedding. It was a friend that didn't want a professional photographer there. They loved seeing some of the work that I'd done, so they, they asked me if I'd like to do it. Um, not so much asked as like told me I had to do it, and I really didn't want to do this wedding at the time because I was absolutely terrified of messing it up. Wedding, one chance, you can't go back and shoot that day. But as they said that they didn't really mind they loved the photos they just wanted something as a record of the day i eventually caved and i actually ended up going to shoot the wedding for them so i shot this first wedding and i remember it was, again i said it was the most terrifying day of my life i think i spent about five minutes of the day not actually sweating profusely because i was so nervous and after the wedding was all done i think i was i was the first one at the venue because i wanted to scope the place out i hadn't pre-visited pre and i went to check it out and um I got there about 10 o'clock in the morning and I was like, I left at like 11 o'clock at night. I was there for like 13 hours for this really small wedding um, that was taking place in a, in a place not too far from me. And I remember I got home, I put the photos on my computer and, and as another fact, it was actually the first time I had ever shot in raw format because I knew that at least I could rescue it to some degree if I messed it up. All my other previous photos and things like that were all shot in JPEG um, because it was just a faster workload and I didn't realize the power of raw photography at the time. So I remember I got home, I put the photos on my computer and I looked through them and I ended up delivering 98 photographs of an entire wedding day to this couple. Thankfully, they loved them. I mean, I've since got rid of every single one of them because I absolutely hated every single one of them. I, I couldn't stand any of them. I thought it was some of the worst work I'd ever seen. At least I wasn't stupid enough to think that I was a wedding pro when clearly I needed a lot of work and there was uh, still a lot of development to go. But the moral of that particular story is that I went out and I did it. Um, I didn't enjoy the wedding, but I did it. And I used the kit I had available and I got some kind of results that were acceptable to the bride and groom. Now granted, I wasn't getting paid and they didn't really care. So the pressure wasn't all that high. Although I did feel pressure, the pressure wasn't that high on me to actually get professional results. But what I'm saying is that I, I shot a wedding, my very first wedding, with a camera which was meant for, it was a tiny plastic body camera with kit lenses. Um, and I, that was the first time I ever shot a wedding on that camera. So the point is, it's not impossible. And had I known more about sort of flash at the time, especially off camera flash, I may have been able to get some better results. I think the, the one thing that hampered the day the most was that it did not stop raining. So the whole wedding, the ceremony, the reception, um, the, the wedding breakfast, the evening do, everything was inside the same venue. So the lighting was really poor. I've been to worse lighting uh, in venues. And when the lighting is poor in any venue, no matter how experienced you are, it does make things more difficult. 
So the point is that I shot a wedding on that camera. It is, was it easy? No, it was incredibly difficult to do. Um, despite the knowledge that I did have, the equipment that I had, it wasn't up to task. ISO 1600, I mean, that is absolutely ridiculous to imagine these days that a camera that only goes to ISO 1600 would be used for anything like a wedding. But what you've got to remember is that before that camera came out, people were, obviously there were other digital cameras as well, but before that camera came out, people were shooting weddings with worse cameras than what I was using then. I mean, and by worse, I mean with even more limited features. Before digital was even a thing, people would shoot weddings with film. So you'd only get a chance to fire off, you know, like, I don't know, maybe if you were lucky, maybe, I don't know, I never shot film, but say 24 frames per roll of film. And if you were lucky, you might get through 10, 10 rolls of film. So you take say 240, 250 photos a day or something like that. Now you'd narrow those down to the best shots and you'd end up with a wedding album with maybe 30 or 40 pictures in it. And that'd be the entire thing. Now I delivered 90 photographs, which were the best of a bad bunch to be honest but what i'm what i'm trying to say is that there's always going to be something better and if you if you limit yourself by saying that you haven't got the right equipment to do a particular thing that you want to do you're going to limit yourself forever because you're never just going to get out there and, and do something that you want to do you're going to think that it's all down to the equipment you're using and if i had a better camera or better lights then i could go out and i could do this and i could create this to some degree, it is true, but probably not in the way that you're thinking. I'm gonna clarify things a little bit about what I'm actually meaning, yeah? So this camera here is one of my two Canon EOS 6D Mark Ones. And I bought this in the first one in 2014. So it was a couple of years after it came out. The reason I upgraded was that the tools that I had available to me back then, i.e. the 400D and you know the limited amount of lenses I had with it, were the two, I'd outgrown the tools. They were, they were no good for me anymore. I was at a point where my creativity was outperforming my ability to capture what I wanted using the equipment that I had set up. And this is the thing that everybody who does photography, videography, any sort of creative passion, it goes for everything, that, that your equipment that you're using is just a tool. It is simply just a tool. Someone could have given me uh, a, a, an EOS 1DX at the start of my photography career, and I still wouldn't have got the results that a professional would get with years worth of experience because although the camera would have been amazing that doesn't make you amazing and it sounds obvious but when you get sucked into this sort of trap of consumerism and and all the marketing that goes along with all this new equipment sometimes you can get caught up in all this hype and think that if you if you just had a better camera then you'd be able to create better better art and whatever it might be but if you were gonna say build a house for example, say a wooden house. Would you rather use a hammer with nails or would you rather have a nail gun? Now, if you knew what you were doing and you knew how to build a house and you knew how to put all the parts together, obviously a nail gun is gonna be a lot easier and a lot faster than having to individually hammer every nail into that house. If you didn't have a clue about how to build a house out of wood and I gave you a nail gun, and all the best tools available, that isn't gonna help you at all. You may as well be stuck with a hammer and nails because you're gonna get about as far with a nail gun as you are with a hammer and nails because you haven't got that, you haven't built on your knowledge of the raw materials in order to use the tools that you've been given to their most effective use. So basically what this boils down to is what I said at the beginning. Gear doesn't matter, but it does. It doesn't matter when you're starting out and if you haven't got the, the creative skills to get the most out of the tools that you've got, then buying more expensive tools and, and better looking tools and better performing tools is not gonna help you create that, reach your creative dreams because you're not gonna get the most out of those tools. You're not gonna use all of the features available to make the most of what you've been given. So you should really be starting with a solid foundation and only progress through different tools when you really feel that you have reached the limit of the tools that you already have. Don't let people put you down based on the equipment that you've got. Go out, create something with what you've got. Another great quote is that the best camera you've got is the one that you've got with you. 
So if you spot something, you take a photo with a phone or, or a compact system camera or a DSLR, you know, whatever it might be. If you take a great picture or create a great video, that is exactly what it is. If you've got the content there and it looks great and it's come out great, it doesn't matter what you took it with. Don't ever think that by buying more expensive equipment or equipment that people are saying is, is better than the stuff you've got, don't ever think that that will make you a better photographer or videographer or creator. So guys, thanks very much for watching this video today. My name is Tom, this is T-Discovery. If you enjoy the channel, if you've enjoyed the video, please think about subscribing, leave a like, leave a comment. I'll put some links in the description down below to some of the equipment that I do use that I've actually bought specifically for video uh, over, the, over the few years that I've actually been uh, testing it out a bit more. But yeah, uh, leave me any questions you've got down below and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks very much for watching, laters.